Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Webinar Wednesday brought to you by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Today we are talking about how to design a galvanic corrosion control system. This program is brought to you by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. We are a growing coalition committed to advancing best practices in the field of concrete preservation. We draw on our members to get speakers to promote education, awareness of concrete repair industry standards, new innovative corrosion prevention te technologies, and sustainable construction practices. This is the uh, first of our how-to series focused on walking through the design of corrosion systems. You can find uh, recordings of our previous series and, and presentations on our website, wesafestructures.info forward slash events. Some other great news is our seminar series is back. If you're in North America, check out the seminar series section of our website for locations and dates and get your free registration in while seats are still available. Uh, if you would love us to come visit you, let us know and uh, we'll see if we can get, get out there. David Simpson is uh, giving us a presentation today. He is the Director of Operations for Vector Corrosion Technologies. Uh, he's also got uh, a bunch of degrees there if you want to look up those. Prior to working with Vector, he held positions of Corrosion pr uh, Production Manager for Fosrock International and a Technical Manager for Fosrock, uh, where he specialized in electrochemical repair methods and cement technology. He's also a, a huge foodie and a great dancer. And with that said, I'm gonna let him take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much for that in introduction. It always sounds strange hearing yourself being spoke about that way, but anyway. But anyway, um, thank you everybody for uh, coming to my, my seminar today. Um, as I hope you all aware, this is about galvanic protection uh, and the design of galvanic protection for, for concrete. I just want to put a bit of a, a clear disclaimer out there. I have 45 minutes and it's quite a big topic. Um, so I've had to generalize and summarize in quite a lot of a lot of areas. So um, each project is unique. Each project had its own facets and requirements and, and I can't cover everything off in this presentation. Where I can, I'll give uh, some pre-qualifications about some of those things. But again, I can't go through everything. As with anything right, around corrosion and engineering, we'd always recommend if you're looking at a project that you uh, consult with a qualified corrosion engineer, uh, and this presentation is there to inform and to provide a brief insight of that process. Like I say, I try my best, it's quite a big ask, uh, but I hope you all get something from this uh, and uh, I'll see you at the end with the questions, I guess. So to start the process, I want to break the, the, the design process down into a variety of different stages. Uh, so the first stage really I want to talk about is do we have a corrosion issue? It seems basic. It seems a silly question in some respects, but again, it's really important that we understand the, the root cause really and how we define that problem first and foremost, and that requires uh, testing and evaluation and understanding of the structures that we have. While a lot of the things we'll talk about today are technical in nature, uh, there are a lot of constraints and restrictions that can be commercial and, and, and affect the design where are not technical in nature. And again, I want to go through that because, again, it's a very important part of the design process. And then we have to think about what we're trying to achieve. What information do we want, uh, do we need to do the design and the galvanic system? We'll go through that. And then I'll go through two specific examples. One is a galvanic repair protection scheme, which we call cathodic prevention. And then we have a fusion uh, protection scheme, which is a two stage process, which is a bit more complicated. Uh, and we do two designs for that, one for passivation and then one for cathodic prevention. And then at the end, I'll summarize and then we'll have some questions as we go through. So really in the beginning, um, as I said before, we would look to say, well, do we have a corrosion issue? Because corrosion is not always the primary cause of concrete deterioration. I'm hoping a lot of you are, are engineers out there and have seen some of these things, but it's good to summarize. We have things like free store, which is the, the bottom uh, left hand picture here, where we have uh, the cold cycling breaks down the co cover of the concrete, can expose the steel, and then so, uh, corrosion can become a secondary effect of that. We then have structural design issues like uh, loading issues, cracking, dynamic cracking of structures, which obviously breaks down the concrete, gives a, a, a space for chloride, moisture and oxygen to get down to the steel, and then corrosion can become a secondary effect after that. We then have ASR, alkali acidic reaction, which again breaks down that concrete cover and can accelerate corrosion. And then finally, we have sort of chemical tech on the right hand side here, which again, um, it's the concrete issue, not the corrosion. The corrosion is secondary. So understanding whether you have a primary or secondary corrosion issue is really important when we're, when we're looking at a structure from the outset. 
Well, the biggest um, things we have to do um, as, as corrosion engineers is ascertain risk. As any engineer would want to do, we deal in risk and risk management. Uh, and the only way that we can look at risk is by evaluating the structures we have. And we have a number of techniques that we use. I don't have time to go through every one individually and go through that. But things like carbonation, car chloride, concrete cover, petrographic XRDs, half cell potential mapping are, are the common ones and delamination surveys that we come up with. There are others out there, and I'm not saying this is a, is a, is a complete list, but those are the ones as a corrosion engineer we tend to look at on the, in a most common basis. Now, you'll see as I go through this, this, this webinar that I'm gonna reference a number of other, other presentations that have come before me. They're very detailed in a lot of the information that I'm gonna provide, and I would, um, I would urge you all to use this as reference material. Uh, once you go away, you have access to this presentation. You can go back and and, and go into as much detail as you as you see fit. So this presentation here from Brian Pales that was done uh, a couple of years ago now is a really good uh, good one to look for for all of these techniques, uh, non-destructive and destructive techniques for for evaluating concrete. But as I said, we're trying to do is assign risk and we try to understand that risk because the problem we have with reinforced corrosion in most cases is that it's not uniform over a structure. OK, uh, and the reason why it's not uniform is because we have variability in things like concrete cover and therefore protection levels because concrete cover is the primary uh, defense mechanism that we have for, for reinforced concrete and steel. And we have variability in water exposure and therefore chloride contamination. We have structural variability which can exaggerate both of those. And then we also have variability in concrete quality during construction and we have to remember it wasn't that long ago that we we're including chlorides already in the mix from from new construction so again all of those things will give us variability and what we need to do is address that variability and divide the structure into sub zones um, so that we can we can deal with them all independently and correctly now Without that information, it becomes very difficult. And what we end up doing is assuming, and, and that normally either means we overprotect or underprotect. And both of them have, have consequences that we have to consider when we look at the data that's available. But again, concrete testing is, is a vital part of the design process. Here's one example of, of concrete cover. Um, I have included this because it's a, a sort of new technique that we're using. Obviously, I'm pretty sure you're all aware that access is one of the most difficult things to, to have on projects. And this robot here, which you can see uh, hopefully on the, on the left hand picture here, is mounting with equipment to take cover surveys. So we only have to get access to a certain position and then we can analyze the, the, the concrete cover and the variability. So in the center here, we have the, uh, the, the, the data represented, uh, represented this way, and you can see that concrete cover massively varies over the structure. So again, where it's red, we have a concrete cover that's lower than what the specification is. In the green areas and the darker green areas, we have a, uh, a concrete cover that is greater than what was specified. So you can see we have a potential <coughs> for, for, for uh, corrosion variability based upon concrete cover. What was interesting with this with this structure is obviously we also did on top of this uh, a cover survey we did a half cell potential survey so cover is only given to give us uh, a probability and the half cell potential survey only gives us a probability but it gives us a greater probability on the rate and the potential risk of corrosion that will be occurring and as you can see in this example while we have variabilities in cover we don't have a huge amount of variability in, in half cell potential survey so for this example cathodic protection may not be the most viable solution we could look at cover uh, we could look at coatings renders you could look at uh, silane siloxanes as other options to extend the life of this structure now it may be that the client doesn't want to ever come back and cathodic protection could be an option but again that comes down to the nuances of that particular project and situation that that structure is within now chloride testing um, I'm, I'm i'm pretty sure most of you have probably seen um, but obviously, as a general rule of thumb, as the level of chloride in the concrete increases, we get an increased probability of corrosion. Now, there are typically two ways of doing this. We have by weight of cement uh, and we have parts per million. Technically, by weight of cement is more um, more efficient, but we have to know what the cement content is. And the only real way of doing that is analyzing the, con uh, the concrete sample for, for XRD and finding out what the level of cement in there. If we assume anything, then either of them are going to be viable. 
to do that. But it's quite interesting how we represent that data um, when we're looking at risk. So in the picture on the right hand side in the graph, you can see what we have here is the mean uh, concrete cover, and then we have the standard deviation of that cover, and then we have the threshold level where corrosion becomes a problem. And we can see that the majority of these samples have a heightened risk of corrosion at the depth of steel. And that's really useful information for us, and we can quantify that risk better in terms of risk management. Water exposure, um, I sort of bring this up, I think, on every every presentation I've given so far on, the, on this webinar series, but I think it's a really important thing. While it's not a, a necessarily a test method, it's a, it's a good observation to have to identify where other areas might be of interest for us to do testing, like chloride testing, to do half cell potential mapping, because we have to remember that that chloride typically dissolves in water and gets into the concrete through water if it's not already cast in. So again, for the majority of the cases that we deal with, it's migratory corrosion, uh, chloride, sorry, that is, is, is the main cause. So understanding where water goes on your structure is a really viable technique for breaking the structure down into zones. Now, typically it's easier to go onto a structure when it's, when it's been raining or it's had water exposure of some sort, but typically that's not always possible. But we also have telltale zones of, of surface scouring, surface markings. You can see on the left hand side there we have this, this green um, algae or, or mold grown on the concrete. And again, that's clear indication that that moisture has been present and that's probably going to be a high risk area for us. Half cell potential mapping, we, we do go on about this a lot because I think it's being used far more widely now and I think it's a really valuable technique of breaking structures down into zones, which is the whole point of, of what we're trying to do when we're designing with galvanic systems. So this is a, an example of a half cell potential map of a, a, a bridge deck. And what's interesting of this is we've overlaid the delamination surveys on top of it. So again, you can see there is good correlation between where the delaminated concrete's occurring, but there's other areas here which are at risk uh, that is not currently deteriorating uh, the concrete surface. <clears throat> now, this is really important to us because if we just deal with the with the design the system to deal with the patches, um, to do with the repair, the go. Um, that's not going to that's only half the equation here. The other areas are going to be at risk and, and we deem these risk areas that are not currently deteriorating as short to medium risk. And what we mean by that is typically those are the areas that are going to corrode within the next five to 10 years. So if you do a scheme like this within that time period, you're most likely going to have to come back and carry out further repair, really. And that may be right for that structure. It may not be. And that's a decision that we have to make as we as we go through the design process. But as I said, all this is about is analysing risk. Um, not one test method is going to give you all of that information. So typically we look at multiple techniques to give us that information. Um, and ultimately what we want to get to is understanding that risk and then think about the systems. And some of them may lead you down cathodic protection, but that may not always be the case. But for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to assume that we have a primary cause of corrosion, which is chloride induced corrosion. It just makes it simpler for, for the presentation as we go through. Now, one of the, the biggest things that we have to do as corrosion engineers is really think about the commercial aspects of, of the structure. We need to understand what the client's needs are. We have to understand what the structural needs are and what we're trying to achieve in the first place. And a lot of those don't tend to be technical in nature. Some of them are life expectancy, um, some are location and access. We've had many instances where we've worked above water, where we have train tracks, <clears throat> we have increased vandalism. We've had systems where we've been on nuclear power stations where we can't change the size of a concrete element. All of those things impact the type of system that you're looking to use and the installation method of those systems because they all vary uh, and they all have their, their advantages, but they also have their considerations. One of the biggest things that we always have to come across uh, or we always come across is cost versus benefit, which is, a, which is an interesting equation. It varies for every uh, situation, but again, we have to do that as corrosion engineers. We have to be technically correct and and, and, and um, uh, appropriate for the structure, but there is always a cost element to the systems that we're using. There may also be monitoring and maintenance requirements above and beyond what, we ha what we're thinking for the system, but there are also health and safety considerations for particular situations and also environmental impacts. We've, we've done work on sea life centres where uh, we've protected tanks uh, and some of those tanks contain sharks and there are uh, magnetic field uh, issues that have been raised in the past. So again, 
it, that's more of a technical one, but again, it's more of an environmental one in terms of leachate and everything that, that may occur from, from that type of environment. And I think it's an important point to raise to everybody that, that it's not just the technical things that we have to deal with when we're doing a design. But ultimately within within vector how we approach it we try and break these structures down into three distinct zones we have a zone one which is at the top there where we have concrete deterioration that we can visibly see we know repair has to be done uh, and immediate action has to be required uh, required and that's an area where we look at incipient anode as the highest risk area especially with chloride contaminated concrete so we're looking for systems to make that repair stable, which is the first and the longest use of galvanic anodes in, in, in concrete repair or in concrete as a whole. We then look at stage uh, uh, zone two, where we have concrete deterioration, which is not present, but through our testing and evaluation, we've identified that corrosion is at a short to medium risk, which as I said, is corrosion is likely to be visible within the next five to 10 years, resulting in further concrete deterioration and structural deterioration. And then we have concrete deterioration that is not present again, but again, is a much lower risk for us. And at that point, it depends on the structure, depends on the requirement of the client, whether some sort of cathodic protection or other the system may be uh, may be viable for for the life extension that they're looking for but again that's going to be varied dependent upon the structure and the situation that you find yourself in now the first use of galvanic anodes are, are 24 years old now uh, and a presentation that was given again a couple of years ago by dr dr george sergi is a really interesting one that goes through a lot of the evolve uh, involved evolving of the technology as a, as a whole in terms of where it's come from and the monitoring of that information over the past 20 years and most of the um, new design techniques that we use with galvanic systems have come from the analyzing of that data uh, and again this presentation is a really good reference uh, material for you to go back and look at if you want to learn more about incipient anode formation the performance of galvanic anodes long term and how we've come to where we are today in their design and use and predictability of their performance. But incipient anode formation, uh, if you aren't aware, is the accelerated breakdown of a patch repair. So we come along, we do a repair, and within a short period of time, you'll find that that, that outside of the repair will break down and that, 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 that continues and you have to come on site, do more repair, and it gets larger and larger and accelerates in, in rate. And that's because of the, the imbalance that we set up between chloride and non-chloride areas when we're doing patch repairs. Again, I haven't got time to go through the whole mechanism. I'll just refer you to, to George's presentation. Again, hopefully a lot of you on this call have seen that and have witnessed this to yourselves and you're, you're, you're aware of the problem. But as I said, it's the first use of, of galvanic anodes in, in reinforced concrete and it's an example, the first example I'm going to give you today in terms of the design process. So galvanic repair protection is what we classify as cathodic preventing, uh, prevention. We're preventing corrosion from occurring on the outside of the patch. So the first element is identifying and analyzing the root cause of problem which we've gone through. We look at structural zoning, which we've also gone through. The next phase really is at risk classification and current density requirements, because obviously at the end of the day, the steel wants to accept current or needs to accept current to provide protection. So that's the most important element is setting up that risk classification and how much current density we need to design for. We then have to take into account climate considerations and temperature considerations, because it has a big impact on the life expectancy of galvanic systems. We then look at the steel reinforcement evaluation and the steel density calculation, because obviously the more steel we have, the more current we need to provide. The less steel, the less current um, per, per area. So again, that's a really important consideration for us. Then we look at the current density prediction with time. And then finally, we come to zinc mass qualification. Now, if any of you know me personally, you know I have a big bugbear about zinc mass. Uh, zinc mass is important because we need zinc in a structure. However, you will see that it's the last qualification item on the design process and that's because we design our anodes to last a period of time. Um, zinc mass is important but as you'll see in the further slides that we have today it is not as important as you may think and if there's one thing you go away with today is I want you to go away with understanding that more zinc is not necessarily the right thing that you're doing. But we'll come back to that as we go through the presentation. <coughs> 
Now, there was a presentation given by Dave Whitmore at the back end of last year, which was, was really well attended and sets out a lot of the um, design parameters that I'm going to summarise today. So again, as with uh, Brian's presentation, George's presentation and Dave's, I would reference you go back to that because it sets up a huge amount more detail of the, the individual items that we, we use and, and why we use them and how we've come to those elements uh, of the design process. So things like surface area to mass ratio, efficiency, um, um, uh, galvanic aging terms and where they come from. Again, it's all covered in there and I would reference that and refer to that as, as much as you can because I think it's a great reference material for everybody. But all of that information that, that Dave presented in that presentation gave us what we have now within our data sheets, okay? So our data sheets look at risk classification and for repair scenarios, chloride concentration is normally the easiest one for us to identify and it's typically the one that we, we use to, to break a structure down in terms of risk categories within corrosion. But typically the ISO standard and, and soon the NACE standard, I believe, will have this, this recommendation for cathodic prevention, which is providing a current density of 0 0.2 to 2 milliamps per meter squared. Sorry for the units. I'm sure you can do the conversion uh, there. There's a little bit of conversion in this table as well. Now, you'll notice that our minimum current density starts at 0 0.4, and that's because we believe 0 0.2 is only really relevant for new construction where no chloride is, 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 is present. Now, there's another webinar series, another presentation being done in a couple of weeks by Dr. George Sergis specifically on new construction. And again, I would refer you to that in a couple of weeks, and that gives a lot more detail in terms of the use of that 0 0.2. But from our perspective, we believe the minimum current density that we need to apply onto steel is 0 0.4. But as the chloride level increases, we need to then increase the amount of current that we apply. And that fits within the ISO and the NAE standard in terms of what we're looking to achieve. But what I want you to draw your attention to is that is the current density at end of life. It is not the current density at the beginning of the system. It's not an average over the whole life of the system. It's the average current at the end of life that we're looking to do. Because at the end of the day, protection is only received by the amount of current, not the amount of zinc that you have or anything else. The steel must receive current. And that current needs to increase as the level of risk of corrosion also increases. And that's what you can see um, uh, in, the, in the table that you have. So what I'm trying to do today is just break down a little bit more of the data sheet, where these figures come from, how we've come to these figures, so you can have a better understanding of the design process as, as a whole. It's also important to note that these current densities are based upon an average temperature of 10 degrees C on average. That's where all our data has come from. And temperature plays a big role as we increase the temperature. So every 10 degrees increase, we get a doubling of corrosion rate and we get a doubling of current output from our anodes. If you double the current, you halve the life. So you can't use standard anodes in very high temperatures. And I'll come back to that in, in a while. But I think that's an important point to make when you're looking at our data sheets going forward, that these are based upon the standard anodes are based upon 10 degrees C average. Once you go, go above 15 degrees C, you have to use a different anode. And again, I'll come back to that a bit later. But these current densities, um, this is the model that we use um, to, to work out those current densities. Now, as a patch repair, we have our anodes within a patch, as you can see, and we have the boundary of the patch. We are not looking to protect 20 inches, 30 inches, 300 millimeters into the concrete. It's only the boundary that's at risk of incipient anode formation. So our boundary conditions when we're doing our modeling to predict current density with distance and time is based upon 100 millimeters or four inches outside the patch and at these nodal points here in red. So it's the furthest distance really between two anodes within the patch. That's how our model is set up. That's what our data sheet is based upon. So hopefully that gives you a bit more insight when we talk about current densities for patch repairs or galvanic repair. That's what the, 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 the boundary condition is set up for. I've already mentioned this just, but obviously once we've understood the risk category and what current density we need, we now need to take into account where we are in the world. If we're designing something in Dubai, 
um, it's going to be very different to something in New York or London, for example. And like I said, anything above 15 degrees C average temperature for a place, we have to use a different anode in that instance. And you'll see on all of our data sheets now uh, and going forward, you have an X range on the on the uh, an X range variant of the product. And that product is there to accommodate those much higher current density requirements and performance requirements in those temperatures. And I'll show you the graph and the impact of that as we go forward. But the next step once we have the risk classification is to say where are we in the world and what's the temperature impact on the performance long term. So as I said, steel density calculation is really important. Um, we have to apply enough current onto the steel to provide protection. The steel wants current. It doesn't care where that current comes from. It could be impressed current cathodic protection from mains uh, when it's converted to DC. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether it's ICCP or, or galvanic, it will accept current. And it is that current that provides the protection. So we need to fully understand how much steel surface area we have per concrete area. And it's typically calculated in a square meter or per square foot basis. We also need to make sure that during our testing phase that all the steel is continuous. Obviously, we can only protect the steel that we can connect to. If it's discontinuous electrically, we cannot protect it. So it's, again, it's an important thing for us to, to, to understand when we're doing a, a cathodic protection system design. Now, this information is usually found on as-built drawings, but if anybody have ever looked at them, they're normally missing. They can be very old. They're normally scans of scans, and they can be very blurred and difficult to access. And often, what was designed in the engine room floor, engine room, sorry, the engineering floor, uh, isn't very different to what was actually constructed on site. Therefore, a validation process needs to be taken. And again, we would always recommend that be done during the testing phase. And GPI is a really good uh, technique to an option for, for, for that evaluation. Here's just a couple of examples of, of a couple of GPR scans here. Again, it's a non-destructive technique. It allows us to analyze steel. The diameter of bars we can get from that, the spacing of the bar we can get for that. Now we will always do a validation. So typically we either do repair areas that have where steel is exposed to do a, a calibration against it, or we do a breakout area to, to do that. And at the same time, we can test continuity um, and, and see where that, that varies. But obviously a structure is going to have different steel contents all over it, and we have to understand that variability when we're doing our design. And those are the calculations that we have to do at the forefront of the design process. So in general, the calculation is very simple. We have a drawing here of a an example, which is a car park ramp. It's very thin. So we have to take into account both layers of steel. And the calculation is simple. We have the bar diameter multiplied by its length, multiplied by the number of bars per area, multiplied by pi. And that gives us a, a breakdown of the steel and an assumption of the steel surface area. Now, this is what you will see typically in Excel spreadsheets for, for cathodic protection designs. And what I wanted to allude to and just point out here is we always typically include an error. And that's because we can't assess all the steel everywhere. Uh, we're looking at representative areas and there's always going to be lapping steel. There's always going to be other rebar that's coming in. And again, you're better off over protecting to a degree than underprotecting. Underprotecting leads to corrosion. Overprotection just leads to more protection. And um, as long as it's not too far over, that's that's true. But in this instance, we typically add around 10% to the to the figure to accommodate those extra steel elements, and then that gives us the the steel density, which you can see here at 1.2. Now. Hopefully you've all seen a Galveston XP before, but it's. I just want to make a point that those anodes have changed significantly over the last uh, 24 years. But fundamentally, they they are the same construct. We have a piece of zinc of high purity zinc in the center with a fixed surface area uh, to mass ratio, which we have changed massively over the years because we've understood the performance of anodes with time and that relationship. But then you have an activator which keeps the zinc active, keeps corrosion products uh, soluble. And then we have a means of connecting that anode and zinc to the reinforcement to provide the electrical connection for the system to work. So the fundamental has stayed the same. The technology has just changed and improved over time. And this anode here is the, is the XP4. So these are the anodes that we're looking to design for galvanic patch repair. So again, just coming back to it, 
once we know what the chloride level is, once we know what the, uh, the current density requirement is, we now know what the steel is, we can now look at the spacing to achieve that level of current density. So if we take the high risk corrosion level, which is the mid level, and we look at the steel density of 1.2, you can see the space of the anodes reflect that. And that sets to the boundary conditions of those current densities at end of life. So for this level, we're looking at 0 0.8 milliamps per meter squared at end of life, which for our system is 20 years for the XP range. Now, if you plot that current and performance out with, with time, this is what it what it looks like. So you can see the gray area here is, is, is the extremely high scenario. And you can see what happens is the anodes start off healthy and young, if you want to think of it as people. And as we age, we don't perform as well because we have things like reduction in surface area and mass. We have uh, changes in uh, uh, efficiency. We have corrosion product buildup in, in, in areas. And those all change the conditions around the piece of zinc, which affect performance. That's what we, what we mean when we say galvanic anodes age. OK, and we've defined our anodes over 24 years of how they perform, but all galvanic anodes age with time. Um, I think it's a fundamental that 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 we're everybody's now realizing and again we're using this fundamental of this aging to understand how we best make performance design criteria for our anodes but you can see here that if we're in um, it's uh, in the extremely high our current density starts off as high as six milliamps per meter square and slowly drops off to the minimum currents that we have now you'll see that the anodes don't just die at that point they're going to carry on producing current but you're dropping below the minimum that we believe is necessary to keep corrosion at bay it may vary by a couple of years but the reality is once you start dropping below those minimum levels we can't guarantee performance and everything that we are trying to do with our systems and our products now is to more get towards guaranteed performance with time because that's what people want uh, that's what people need is certainty and understanding performance requirements now as I said, this is based upon an average of 10 degrees C. If we move to um, greater than 15 degrees C, you can see that the current requirements jump up. So instead of six, we're now at 12. Instead at 0 0.4 here, we need to be at 0 0.8 and everything jumps up and therefore we need a different anode. We can't just use our standard anodes to do that. Uh, and we have to change the surface area to mass ratio to be able to predict out and make sure we're achieving those minimum current densities at end of life. And that's a really important point. You can't just go around using standard anodes unless you want a lower life. And if you want only 10 years, for example, then yeah, okay, the standard anodes might be viable in that solution. If you want 20 years, or, or even plus with other systems, you have to design with specifically anodes that have been designed to deal with those higher current densities and uh, loss of mass of zinc. Now, I said I would come back to mass of zinc uh, because it is a bugbear of mine, but I want you to, to, to illustrate the, the, the point in, in far more detail. So if you imagine an XPT, which is the blue line here, over 20 years to achieve the current densities I've just set out, we only lose 20 grams worth of zinc. The product contains over 60 grams worth of zinc. So we have 40 grams worth of zinc, which you'd say, well, that's that's just waste. We don't need that level of, uh, of zinc, but it's not the level of zinc that is important. It's the current output. And you can see that as the as the anode ages, we get a reduction in current with time. So, yes, the anode will probably still produce current for 40, 50 years, but that current is going to be at a much smaller and smaller and smaller amount that you're not going to get the protection from it so all of our anodes have excess zinc and that excess zinc and that's why i'm saying to you it doesn't matter whether somebody comes up and said oh my anode contains two pounds of zinc or my anode contains 60 grams worth of zinc what's important is understanding how that anode produces its current with time because the steel wants current not massive zinc it's not concerned about how much zinc goes into the structure and as we do as we modify the design process and as we understand galvanic anodes more and more that's becoming more relevant uh, and i'm hoping the, you understand that that point that i'm making because i'm going to carry on talking about it forever i think so anyway, we, we have the spacing chart, we understand our risk profile, we put our anodes in and then we make make good uh, the repair. And obviously then we stop the incipient anode formation for the length of time that's within the design parameters of the structure. Now, there's one thing that I just wanted to highlight quickly, because again, I'm trying to give practical advice as well as, as the process, but estimating the number of anodes to go into galvanic repair is typically quite difficult. Uh, and that's because the repair sizes massively vary. Uh, as any of you know who've done repair, 
once you've done a delamination survey, the actual size of the repairs can vary anywhere between 20 to 50 percent. I've even seen higher than that uh, compared to what the original delamination survey is. And that's because often we try and cut clean back to uncorroded rebar. The delamination doesn't fully quantify uh, total areas. So again, it becomes quite difficult um, because the larger the repairs, um, the less the perimeter is. So you tend to find you use less anodes as the repairs get bigger and more anodes as the repairs get smaller, which is counterintuitive, but it tends to be how it is. Now, I don't want you to go away and say, well, I read, a, uh, I listened to a presentation by David and he said it's this exact number. This is a typical rule of thumb for us and it will vary from project to project, but we've always used an estimate of three to four anodes per square uh, per square meter for for an estimation of of how many anodes are required for sort of bill of quantities because I think it's an important part when we're looking at design to give estimates for contractors and anybody to price the work that they have a, a a rule of thumb to use and that's typically what we use. So some of the take home um, um, messages I would like you to to take from this really is. Zinc mass does not determine anode output and therefore the level of protection. It's always going to be a combination of activator, surface area, zinc mass, efficiency and utilisation. And again, Dave Whitmore's presentation is a very good um, breakdown of all of those elements, which I would recommend you look at. Um, all our anodes pretty much contain excess zinc and it's because it's not because like we want to weight a zinc, it's we have to manage the change in surface area to mass ratio with time which impacts the current output of our anodes. Um, so again, performance is related always to current density, not mass of zinc. And we need to start designing for minimum current densities with, with time. And that's the only way that we can improve the design process with galvanic anodes and material manufacturers need to be showing you when you're doing these designs, how their anodes work and how they predict their performance with time. And we also take into account the average temperature plays a huge role in terms of longevity. We just can't use the same products and expect the same life expectancy when we're using them. So I'd like to go on now into, into a different design process, still a relative galvanic anode, it's Galvashield Fusion. Um, and as I said before, it's basically two designs in one. We have to design a, a, a passivation phase. So if you think about how corrosion occurs, we have chloride at the rebar, we have a pit that forms. By passing a very high current density and charge density on the steel and charges current multiplied by time, uh, we're able to pre-passivate the steel by removing chloride and through the cathodic reaction build up the hydroxyl line, which is the alkalinity, which is able to re-passivate the steel. And once that, that stage is passed, we then move to a cathodic prevention or a maintenance stage where we apply a much lower current density over a long period of time to keep the status quo, to keep the steel passive for that length of time. And again, that falls under the cathodic prevention classification of the ISO and NACE standard. And again, the big difference here is we're able to design for 30 years because we're having to provide a much lower current at, at a much greater period of time. And because the way the galvanic anodes work and they age with time, that's what really uh, sets apart the fusion design process. So if we just break down the anode, because I think it's it's interesting to see how, how that's achieved, we basically have two anodes in one. We have a self-powered ICCP system, which is run from a battery. Um, so again, there's no external power source there, which produces the current for stage one. We then have a Galvashield CC anode on the top for all want intense purposes, uh, which is basically there to provide the second stage of performance over the 30 year period. Both of those are surrounded by our alkali activated mortar, which is also acid buffering for stage one. And again, that's where we've got our last 24 years worth of data on and performance of our nodes. And then we have a single wire installation, which again makes things a lot more simple. So for stage one, as I said, we relate the corrosion risk again and typically through the chloride level by weight of cement to see how much charge we need to pass. Again, charge is current multiplied by time during stage one. And we do that to stop corrosion to passivate steel. And this allows us to calculate the number of anodes that we require per, per unit area to provide that level of protection, which I'll come to. And again, stage two is the maintenance phase. And again, the ISO standard and A standard coming conforms that to 0.4 in our instance, so 0.2 to 2, but we're looking at a minimum current density at 0.4 milliamps per meter square, this time at 30 years, so we have an extended period of time. 
So this is a this is the example that I would like to go through. It's a, it's a real life project. We have data just to back the performance and the design quote, uh, specification that we came up with. Um, but basically here we have a an abutment wall and we have a, a pier here, a central pier, which we actually also protected. Um, so again, it's a real life structure. Here are the, uh, the the as built drawings. As you can see, they tend to be quite old. Uh, they tend to be in uh, different. Um, they, they tend to be scans and therefore difficult to read. So again, they're quite they're, they're, they're quite difficult. We're lucky on this one that we had them, uh, but again, we did validation on site anyway to confirm that, and it did vary based upon what you uh, saw on the as built drawings. And then we do the same calculation bar diameter by length, by number per area, multiplied by pi. And in the abutments, we had three zones. We had the top section, we had a middle section, we had a bottom section. So we had three different steel densities. I'm only going to show you one for now. But again, as we saw before, we have the calculation, we have the 10% error, and then we get a steel density for that particular area. And once we've got that information, once we know the level of chloride that we have, we can then design the amount of charge that we need to pass. Now, from our research and development uh, over the past sort of six, seven years now, we know that as the amount of chloride increased in concrete, the amount of charge we, we need, current multiplied by time, increases. So as we increase the level of chloride, we need to pass more and more charge to passivate that steel. And as a general rule of thumb, um, we have the amount of charge required is the percentage of chloride by weight of cement multiplied by 100. And we have a minimum on that, and the minimum is 75 kilocoulombs per square meter, and we have a maximum of around 300 kilocoulombs per square meter. So we have to be within that range. And typically, multiplying 2%, as you can see here, by 100 means we're in that 200 kilocoulombs per square meter, which you can which you can see here. Now, a standard fusion anode has a capacity of around 50 kilocoulombs per anode. Now. That's not necessarily true. They have up to 70 kilocoulombs uh, per anode, but that varies depending on how fast we produce the current and the general temperature that we run in the anode at. So we always design to the lower end, and that works well as you'll come to see with the, uh, with the uh, second stage of the process and design. So we multiply the charge required 200 by the steel density 0.7 and we divide that by 50 which is the output of the anode and that gives us the number of anodes required um, to provide 200 kilocoulombs per square area and this instance that will give us an anode space in on center in a grid formation of 550 millimeters or around 22 inches in this instance. We then go on to the second stage and say, does, does three anodes per square meter give us 0 0.4 milliamps meter squared at 30 years? And in this instance, you can see it does by using the half-life principle or the galvanic aging principle. We can see that the current goes from a two milliamps meter squared all the way to 0.4 at 30 years. So that's well within the specification that we have. So it's at the top end of the range at the beginning and it's at the bottom of the range at the end. So again, that's, that's relative to what we're trying to achieve. And then we look at zinc loss with the 75% utilization efficiency. You can see that per square area, we need 281 grams of zinc. So let me just go back a second. So you can see here, even if we had more charge in stage one, we wouldn't be able to take the anodes further apart because we weren't we wouldn't be producing that minimum current density at 30 years. Now, if you only wanted 20 years life, then we could take the anodes further apart to to achieve what we need to do. But again, that comes down to the conversation. Typically, most people want the longest length of time. So again, that's what I've shown here. But there are some variations that we can make uh, depending on what the client and what the structural needs physically are. And this is just a representation of the aging term again, going from the high level of current as it ages down to its end of life use, which again is that minimum of 0.4. And you can see here the zinc loss with time. And you can see we're well within the parameters of the anode. It has more than 100 grams worth of zinc. So we have enough zinc. And again, like I say, zinc normally becomes not really that relevant to us. We just need to check and make sure that it's okay. So once we've once we've done those things, we then are able to produce a pre-qualification or a product specification, which then goes out to to the bidders of the work. And within the design, we identify 
the current density prediction, uh, say the activation method, because if you're looking for alternatives and equivalency, that's really important because not all anodes are the same. We then have to provide the galvanic aging term that has been used as a design, the anode efficiency and utilization, the temperature evaluation and performance, and then obviously the end, the zinc mass uh, prediction. And the material manufacturer that's pre-qualifying against the specification should be able to provide you with all that information. If they don't, I would question the material manufacturer. But again, that, avail that should be available and they should be giving you that information up front to qualify it against the product specification and performance specification. Then typically we do the drawings uh, and this instance, this was a central pier. And again, you can see the variation in spacing and number of anodes based upon the steel layout, the corrosion uh, level and the risk that's there. But again, that's what we typically produce as a pack for the design process. And this is just some of the data from, from the monitored site. Um, so this, this project I think is three years old now and it's being continuously monitored. Uh, it doesn't need to be, but again, we do. And for any larger project, we would always look at installing validation because I think it's really, really important. But you can see here of two of the zones that were monitored, we're well above the, the 200 kilocoulomb mark of what the standard specification or the, the, the calculation required. And that's because, like I said, there's typically more charge density in the, in the battery than than, than what we design with. And then on the second side here, we can look at the current density change with time. So this is stage one here, and when it levels out, that's stage two. And again, if we work it back, that's well within the parameters of what we set up for the actual current density at the start of the system. So again, all, all, all reverts back to the design and it's clear. Now, Passivity or causing passivation of the steel is a really important point with 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 uh, with Galva Shield fusion. So again, we need a way of assessing whether we achieve that, and the way that we can do that is by using again the ISO standard and the NACE standard because within it, it tells us that if the steel is more positive than minus 150 silver silver chloride then we're in the passivity realm and what you can see here is an evaluation of, of turning the system off for 24 hours and then measuring the potential of the steel and as you can see here is as we go through stage one and into stage two we have a movement in the uh, the native potential as we call it or the open circuit potential and you can see that they have moved from active to uh, passive zones we can also do uh, a non uh, a, a nonlinear polarization method, which is basically an equation that looks at the apparent corrosion rate from that data. And again, we don't use it as an absolute, it's only a trend. But again, you can see that we have a downward trend in the corrosion rate or the apparent corrosion rate with time. And both of those together give us confidence that we've achieved passivity on that, on that particular project. Now, a couple of other things just to consider. Um, I've spent 45 minutes going through the whole process of design and I've concentrated really upon flat areas um, and because that's the easiest one to go through. But obviously we all know that not all concrete structures are large flat areas. Columns and beams tend to be designed very differently for us. And that's because they tend to have a different distribution of steel. The steel is not distributed equally around them. And again, if you look at this here, you can clearly see this. So if we just took the whole surface area of concrete and divided up the steel underneath it and, and got an average, you replace in anodes in areas where you don't really need them. So you'll be under protecting these areas and over protecting these areas. So when we look at beams and columns in particular, we tend to break the structure down into faces uh, and look at polinear areas in that. And again, I just wanted to make it aware that there are nuances in the design and uh, not all concrete is flat, flat surfaces. So again, looking at the overall design process now, obviously concrete testing is the first and first and the most important thing that we need to do to get the data. So we evaluate corrosion risk, we evaluate corrosion variability, we look at the reinforcement, revalidation, and then continuity. And those are important points of information that we need for any design system. We then look at the commercial aspects. So again, life expectancy, budget, health and safety and environment. And therefore from that, we can then look at product selection and product type. We then do a design, a preliminary design, 
which basically is everything we've just gone through, which is corrosion risk, steel evaluation and zoning, steel density calculations, and then the anode design. And then we have a really important phase, which we call the review phase. So we revert it back to the commercial impacts and the setup and the boundary conditions that we had in terms of life and, 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 and aspirations for that particular project. And then we review that at that point. If it's okay, it can go out to tender. If it doesn't, it goes back into the design stage and then goes back to the review. But again, that's a, that's an, that's the, an overview of how we would tend to, to to look at a design system. Now, my final slide uh, before I finish really um, is just to make a general point: is that not all anodes are created equal. Each material manufacturer, each anode that's out there uses different activators. They use different zinc surface areas. They use different zinc masses. They have different efficiencies and utilizations, and that's imperative to me to understand the performance of anodes. So again, not all anodes are created equal and it's up to the material manufacturers to demonstrate how they anodes work and age with time. All galvanic anodes age with time. And we need to start designing for end of life, not at the beginning or averages. And again, just remember for the takeaway, performance is related to current density, not the mass of zinc. So thank you for, for, for listening. I'll take any questions that have been posted now. And boy, do we got a lot of good questions. Um, I think we're <laughs> going to need another uh, another 45 minute session just to just to get through all these, but we'll see well, how okay. many we can get through and uh, try my best. Uh, get them all in now. And if, uh, if if we don't get to yours this session, don't worry. Dave's going to get the whole list and you'll you'll get through them. And once he didn't get get to through the show, he'll get back to you on those and you'll still be considered for the card. All right, so. Um, Right up the bat, or sort of right off the bat, we had. Uh, is there a uh, a standard uh, parts per million that you use for the chloride threshold for corrosion initiation? There's an ASDM standard in terms of the method, and again, I think there's a there is one there is one available for that. I don't know the exact name. I know that in Brian's presentation, I think he covers that very clearly. So again, I would point you to that. Um, being a Brit, we tend to use uh, use something slightly different. But again, I think um, Brian's presentation covers the ASTM standard for that. And again, the, the values are in there. Awesome. Is rebar exposure to chlorine in water treatment tanks considered uh, similar to the effect of uh, exposure to chloride? It's different, but again, it's it still causes corrosion. <laughs> so yes, you can. I mean, I think I think that the answer is yes, but it's slightly different. From John, bridges over electrified railroads are often exposed to high straight uh, electric currents uh, from the high voltage lines along the railroad. Yes. Um, do you find that these straight currents can be con uh, need to be considered in the design of galvanic anode systems? All systems, all systems have to be assessed. So the, the easiest way of doing it is measuring the potential of the steel. Um, Again, I think there's a CPA, a, a, um, a Corrosion Prevention Association technical note on this. Um, I'll, when I reply to the, the question directly, I'll, I'll send a link to that, that information. But again, you can monitor whether you have straight current corrosion or not. It's a way of measuring it to see whether it's a problem. But basically, you need to make sure that everything's earthed um, and therefore you won't get straight current corrosion uh, in that instance. But again, it's something that you can measure. It's something that you can uh, design for. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of work uh, involving existing structures tends to be done uh, primarily based on visual observations. Uh, the tests that involve uh, bringing in uh, another agency, how long do you normally find it takes to get uh, someone else to come in and do some non-destructive and destructive testing on a structure? Fairly quickly, I think there are there are many companies out there um, that that are able to do that. It's it's something like VCS as as a company we work closely with. I'm sure they'll be able to come out very quickly. It depends on access normally and requirements for access. More importantly, um, because obviously if you're working at height, if you're looking at restrictions on on access and confined spaces, they all have an impact on how quickly we can get out there and training access to sites. If you're going to a nuclear power site, it's going to be very different if you're you're turning up to a side of a bridge. Um, so again, it can be very quick. A lot of the test methods are, are fairly quick to be, be to be done. As long as you can get access, you can be on and off in relatively uh, relatively short period of time, within two to three days, depending on what you're trying to do. If you're doing a um, 
something like a, 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 a bridge deck, for example, then obviously you have traffic management that you have to take into account. If you have a parking structure, again, you have traffic management. So it's more about you giving the access <laughs> than it is the time it takes to take the take the measurements. Is galvanic protection an option for concrete structures uh, with reinforcement uh, covered in epoxy? Yes, yeah, you can definitely do that. It, again, it's slightly different. It's a nuance. Typically, with epoxy coated rebar, you always have holidays in the in the coating, and that's what causes the problem. So, if chloride ever gets to a holiday, then you will find that your your the the chloride will eat away through that, and you'll get a lot of cross sectional loss in one particular area because you have a very small anode and a humongous cathode. Um, it's the same with pipelines. When they apply cathodic protection to pipelines, you're not protecting all of the pipe. You're only protecting the holidays in any of the coatings that you may have. So yes, it's definitely a viable option. The only things you have to double check are is making sure you have steel continuity because obviously most continuity of steel is made by butting a piece of steel to a piece of steel. Uh, obviously, if you've got a coating on there, that doesn't tend to be uh, making an electrical connection. So continuity is really important, but in theory, yes, you can you can protect it uh, because we just make separate electrical connections to the to, to the anodes. Uh, from Sherry, is data available that shows the cost benefit analysis and life cycle cost uh, of of galvanic cathodic protection in various environments versus more traditional methods such as patching and treating steel? Nothing springs to mind. I think it's a really difficult thing to do. Some people are just, I've seen graphs where, where you have like the repeat costs of coming back. I always find that access is always one of the biggest costs that you find. So coming back and having access to roads, bridges, above water, train tracks, all of those things are massive costs. The actual cost of the anodes versus doing repair is quite low. So to me, they're always the biggest, the biggest cost element and the one that always kicks not coming back and give it a big tick is not getting back and having the access there. I think, I mean, there's one structure I was onto it. I think the access was nearly a million dollars and it was for just basic repair. And again, you're never going to, it's it's always going to outwin that type of scenario, really. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned earlier that uh, higher temperatures can uh, can affect the performance of a protection system. Um, in Alberta, they see temperatures ranging from minus 40 uh, degrees Celsius to plus 35 degrees Celsius. Yep. Is there, uh, does the range, uh, that range make any difference? It, it sort of does. Obviously, at that point, what you probably end up doing is just extending the life of the system, funny enough, because for maybe five, four or five months of the year, you're going to be very low temperatures. And at very low temperatures, the corrosion basically stops and the anode will produce very low currents at that point. But what will happen is as the temperature rises, the anode performance will increase, the level of protection needs to increase. So again, you'll get the protection there. So the swing has an impact, but what you tend to find is as you drop below sort of like five degrees C to zero, the level of corrosion occurs on the steel is, is extremely low. What you tend to get at that point is concrete damage more than anything. Then as everything heats up, the corrosion rate kicks in and then the deterioration starts. So as long as you're providing the current and the protection in the in the warmer, wetter months, then that's the most important um, part. Um, so how effective, in your opinion, is using uh, coated rebar in corrosive environments? With or with, I guess I, I can't ask the question, can I? With or without anodes or performance? Um, Potins have their place, but as I said, they always have they always have holidays on them. There's no perfect coating that's out there. And obviously it impacts the steel continuity. So if you do it from day one, sometimes you have problems applying cathodic protection because you can't make all the steel continuous, for example. Now for a column or beam that, that you could do that because you could do a chase all the way around it and make all the steel continuous on bridge decks uh, uh, and large concrete areas, that tends to be quite difficult. And obviously with, with, um, with coatings, when they're on site and you have uh, construction sites, people are walking over them, people are dropping them on the floor, people are banging against them. You're always going to uh, create uh, holidays in that coating. And it's those holidays that are going to corrode long term. And again, you tend to find an increased rate of deterioration at those areas than when you, if you didn't have any, um, any coating on there. So with anodes, 
I'd say yes. So coatings within patch repairs, for example, there is an advantage of of having coatings in a patch repair when you're using galvanic anodes because you want the current to go out the patch. So there's an enhancement element of applying coatings into a repair scenario um, with galvanic anodes. Um, with um, with new construction, I think that the jewelry's out on that. I would say. Okay. Are concrete repair materials with integral corrosion inhibitors uh, necessary if galvanic anodes are used in the repairs? Um, it depends on what type they are. Um, if they are anodic, you don't want to do that because obviously the anode is the anode and you've got anodic corrosion inhibitors in the patch repair, you have a chance of turning off your anodes. That's not a good idea. If they are cathodic um, inhibitors, um, then they, they may enhance a little bit. But again, I don't I think if you're using galvanic anodes that at the end of the day, you're trying to protect the steel on the outside of the patch, not on the inside. If you're in maybe a marine environment where you have low cover concrete, then again, things like coatings and things like um, things like corrosion inhibitors may may play a role. But again, I think in most cases, the galvanic anode is, is, is a more important item because, again, you're really trying to protect the steel on the outside of the patch, not on the inside of the patch. From Michael, we have uh, can corrosion can the corrosion rate be uh, accelerated in nearby steel that does not have continuity with the protected steel? Uh, no, obviously it's isolated from it in that instance. Unless you've got high voltages where you get stray current corrosion for discontinuous steel, then then that's the exception to that. But I mean, um, you're talking about very vo very low voltage differences with corrosion. Uh, you're talking about minus four fifty to minus. 250 they're very low voltages so you, you're not really it's not really going to influence it in in particularly any way that i can see from ed we have after the cuff, uh, cathodic protection system is installed is there any method that can be used to verify the cathodic protection is working as designed after a few years of installation absolutely i mean with with i mean we're, we're doing a big push personally a validation being done for for most of our structures and and our, our systems we we normally embed reference cells uh within the structure which take the potential of the steel and what we do in the standard set up this way i'd refer you to the nay standard and the iso standard what we look at is the difference between the on and the off potential the nay standard is slightly different we look at the the, the polarized potential you can look at so before and after um, in the iso standard it's more on and off but we're looking for the difference between the ons and the offs and if as long as it's above 100 millivolts shift in 24 hours we're happy that that passes uh, that, that that steel is being adequately protected um but again there's a number of criteria in the standards and again i'd refer you to to 12696 and the relative uh nay standard um they they go into that um, but definitely there, there are definitely ways of, of of monitoring and validating performance against design all right uh, we've got a lot more questions to go, but uh, we are, I think, out of time. So we're going to have to end our Q&A section here. Uh, we will get these questions over to Dave, and he's going to do his best to get back to you all. Oops. You can find Dave after the show here uh, on the, with the information on the screen. Um, feel free to give him a call. He's not going to be going to bed in the next few minutes in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> not too bad. It's 8 o'clock. It's not too bad. Upcoming, we have another webinar in actually just two weeks with George Surhi. He is going to be uh, doing a very similar webinar to today's, but more uh, focused on extending the life of new structures, uh, something that we've alluded to on today's presentation. That is the end of our show. Uh, thanks, Dave, for the presentation. Welcome. Everyone have a great day and let's save some structures. Thank you all.